Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know how it is for you, but, but sometimes as I'm reading scripture, in the middle of all the, the theologizing and storytelling, well, there's a sort of a breakthrough moment, a moment when, when so much that can sometimes seem theoretical or historical becomes very immediate and very relatable. Now, often these moments come for me uh, in the Psalms, and maybe they do for you as well. I mean, in the Psalms, we hear human hopes and fears and, and even rages and griefs sometimes. But another one of those moments for me is at the beginning of our Old Testament reading this Sunday from Isaiah chapter 64. This is on page 623 in the Blue Bibles, so if you'd turn there with me now. Isaiah chapter 64, beginning at page 623. Now here in Isaiah 64, the prophet begins by calling out to God in verse one, oh, that you would rend, tear, rend the heavens and come down. Oh, that you'd rend the heavens and come down. I mean, do you hear what I hear? The the strange mix of of longing and, and frustration and and maybe even a little bit of fear in that first verse here in Isaiah 64. And that makes sense. I mean, Isaiah, he's writing at a time of deep loss, a time of, of deep tragedy and grief among God's people. I mean, the last verses of, of the preceding chapter, chapter 63, they, they lay it out so poignantly. They say to God, and this is beginning at verse 18, the second half, They say, our adversaries have trampled down your sanctuary. And they go on, we have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who are not called by your name. I mean, can you hear the alienation in that? And guess what? There are days that I personally can relate to all of that. Maybe you can as well. I mean, to begin with, I would love to see more of God's presence in my life and his presence in the world around me. I want God to come down to be closer than he sometimes seems to be. And if he won't do that for me for some reason or another, I at least want to hear about him doing that for other people. As I said in my annual report to Epiphany a few weeks ago, that That's one of the reasons that we have been focusing on moments where we have encountered God at Epiphany. And we'll hear another one of those in a few minutes this morning. Fundamentally, we, I, we need a God who is present with us, not absent, right? And to be honest, sometimes I'm frustrated when I don't see God with us more often. I mean, I'll be very honest here. There are days I struggle to pray for one more person with with cancer or some other difficult diagnosis when it seems like something like three times out of five, the math and not my prayer wins. I find it so hard to look around the world and see what a mess things are. And to be honest, I find it even harder to look around the Christian church and see how fouled up things can be among us, the people who theoretically at least are trying to follow Jesus. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. There is longing and frustration there. At least that's what I hear. That's how I'd say it. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. I 
But there's more than that. There is also fear, fear in Isaiah 64. There is a realization here that if God did tear the heavens and come down, well, we might not be able to stand it. Isaiah, he imagines, he imagines mountains quaking and water boiling over quick burning brushwood as pictures of what God's presence with us would do to our world. I imagine all the certainties we live with, right up to death and taxes, being suddenly swept away and replaced by the impossibly powerful and glorious and righteous presence of the Lord of hosts. It would be mind bending and knee knocking. We would be like moths drawn into a flame. God's holiness would burn, but we would be unable to fly away. And that's if he was friendly. And here's what to notice in Isaiah 64. Isaiah isn't saying that God's coming among us would necessarily be friendly. Look at the second half of verse five. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time. And shall we be saved? Now admittedly, the, the syntax, the, the sentence structure is a bit strange here. Christian commentators going back to the third century have, have puzzled over why God's anger comes before our sin. In Isaiah 64, verse five. I mean, shouldn't it be after? We have sinned, then you were angry? Well, maybe, maybe not. Word order and syntax are tricky things in Hebrew, and I am not an expert on this. To be honest, I successfully never took any Hebrew. I actually like what Cyril of Alexandria says about it. He says specifically about this verse, he says, it is no indictment of God's wrath if those overtaken by it find themselves incapable of escaping the onslaught of sin. It's no indictment of God's wrath if those overtaken by it are unable to escape sin. Without God's grace, the Bible says from one end to another that our natural inclination is towards sin, toward rebellion, toward conflict, towards combat with God. We truly are incapable of escaping sin. How could that not be doubly true when we face God's wrath? So on the first Sunday of Advent today, we are caught, we are caught between our longing that God would rend the heavens and come down and to worry somewhere that we are not ready for it. And guess what? I'm not actually going to attempt to resolve this tension for us this morning. Why? Well, Advent is actually meant to be an uncomfortable season. Friends, Advent is not Christmas the prequel. Instead, Advent is the ultimate in-between time. First, we are in between now and our, our yearly celebration of Christmas, of Jesus' first coming. And we know how the story goes. We know what we are waiting for. We know about Mary and Joseph and the, and the shepherds tending their flocks by night and the, and the star and the wise men from the east. But still, every year at this time, we, we reenact the waiting. We compress hundreds of years of longing, the longing of God's people for God's Messiah. And we try to claim it, we try to make it our own. We keep Advent calendars and we do Advent devotionals. We, we light candles on Advent wreaths. And on Sundays we hear from scriptures, both, both people's longings and God's promises to come and be with his people. We do also hear the fear 
alongside the longing. And then, and then when Christmas arrives, we are, we're ready to joyfully celebrate and we're ready to wonder at God's unexpected humility and gentleness toward us. We see that God's righteous anger at our sins will be covered over by his great mercy. And he begins by sending his son, Emmanuel, God with us. But even as we do that, here is what we must also keep in mind. You see, Advent is not only a ceremonial in between time where we reenact the longings of the past and then resolve it every year joyfully at Christmas. Advent is also about our very real longing for Jesus' future return. And there we should not be surprised to experience that same combination of longing and frustration and fear that we hear in Isaiah 64. On one hand, and for many reasons, many, many reasons, we can say with Isaiah, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Or as we begin our worship in Advent, come, Lord Jesus. But we also have many reasons to look to Jesus' second coming not just with hope, but also with fear. Jesus himself, he tells us it will be a power event like no other. He says in Mark 13, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Those are Jesus's own words about what to expect when when he comes again. We're not ready. Our lives are not ready, our hearts are not ready. It is striking to me how many times Jesus delivers one simple message to his followers in Mark 13 as he talks about this. Verse 33, be on guard, keep awake. Verse 35, therefore, stay awake. Verse 37, and what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Friends, I could write a whole library of books filled with all the things I do not know about Jesus' second coming. But I know this, he is coming. His coming is nearer every advent. We should be preparing urgently to meet him. Are we doing that? Will Jesus find us like those servants he describes at work in the master's house, slowly submitting every little nook and cranny of our lives to him? Will he find us doing the most basic thing, loving God and loving our neighbor? By the way, I've been convicted of something when it comes to loving my neighbors. It's this, if I am going to love my neighbors, and I mean my real neighbors here, not just some kind of ethereal concept of neighbors, my real neighbors on Springhaven Drive, you know what would be helpful? If I knew their names. So I'm working on that right now. Jesus would find many faults with me if he came back this afternoon. But at least I would be able to tell him that the couple that lives just east of us is Austin and Mary. Friends, we start where we are in preparing for Jesus' return. For me, that means learning my neighbor's names so that maybe I can begin to love them in Jesus' name. Where are you? What is your next step to prepare for Jesus's return? So friends, Advent is a twofold season. First, we reenact, we relive the longing before Jesus's first coming. His first coming in great humility and weakness. And second, second, Jesus urgently tells us to stay awake, 
to recognize that Jesus is coming again, this time with power unimaginable and glory unescapable. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.